Today's video is going to be on Pierre Esprit de Radisson. Pierre Esprit de Radisson, he's quite the figure when it comes to Canadian history. He's not a very well-known figure either. That's why I'm making this video. I think his story is really interesting. He's someone that came to New France at a very young age. He got captured by the Iroquois, learned Iroquois language, lived with them for a while, and then he managed to escape. Then he explored more of Canada, got engaged in the fur trade, was responsible for the creation of the Hudson's Bay Company. For me, he's sort of like the Jack Sparrow figure of, uh, of our history because he was willing to switch allegiances all the time. He was part of First Nations groups, English at one point. He would go back and forth between English and the French, and he had a sense of adventure. He wanted to discover more of this new land that he, he had arrived in. He was what you would call the classic uh, coureur des bois in French, the bush runners, you would call them in, in English, the men that would roam the forest during the fur trade era. So we're gonna look into his, uh, his life story, explore Canadian history at the same time because he played a role in the development of, uh, of our history, you know, so let's go. Pierre Esprit de Radisson, he arrived in New France in 1652. There's no official documentation of, of Pierre Esprit de Radisson's life, birth certificates and all that stuff, but people estimate that he was around 11 or 12 years old. He establishes himself in uh, Trois-Rivières, in the Saint-Laurent, which is where New France was really concentrated at first. We have to really contextualize what New France was uh, dealing with at the time. New France was in perpetual conflict with the, the Iroquois, the Iroquois Confederacy. The Iroquois Confederacy very quickly were five nations that spoke Iroquoian languages. They were one of the more powerful ones when New France really started establishing themselves in the uh, in the Saint-Laurent. New settlers were constantly facing raids from the Iroquois and the Iroquois would also be uh, raiding other First Nations people like the Algonquins and the Hurons which were allies of the French. After a couple of months of arriving, Pierre Esprit de Radisson got captured. So imagine this guy, he's around 12, 11, 12 years old and he gets captured by uh, by the Iroquois, the enemies of the French. What would happen, he actually got adopted by a family of the Iroquois. Uh, we can go in depth in another video about the culture of uh, the Iroquois Confederacy and mourning wars and all that stuff. Basically what the Iroquois would do at times is that if they would lose someone that was part of their nation, they would sometimes adopt someone that they had captured, for example, to replace that person, right? So during his time with the, the Iroquois, the Mohawks, he actually became part of, of that nation. He learned their languages, he took part in hunting, in warfare, he would take part in raids that would go out west because the Iroquois were really concentrated in what's modern day New York. He explored parts of the Lake Erie area, he would go all the way down to the Ohio Valley, parts of Pennsylvania, Ohio, in parts of northern Ontario. He got to know more about the land and he encountered other First Nations people, got to see what were the customs, the general way of life and how to survive in wilderness. He was really entrenched in that that First Nation lifestyle during that time. In 1654, he managed to escape. So after a year and a half, two years in captivity, he found his way back to Trois-Rivières. You know, by that time, he's 14, 15 years old. He's seen way more stuff than even the average 14, 15 year old during that time. He's an experienced traveler. He's comfortable in different cultural groups. He's multilingual. He was way more capable of being able to establish relationships with uh, new First Nations people because he was just fully entrenched in that lifestyle for a good two years when he was part of the Mohawks. So for a couple of years, he's in New France, in Trois-Rivières. He's going on expeditions for the fur trade because that's how the colony survived at the time. In 1658, he decides, you know what? I wanna go out west. I wanna see if we can get more fur, better quality fur. So he found a partner, Médard de Grosseilly, that was his name. So Médard de Grosseilly, Esprit de Radisson, with the help of indigenous people, they traveled in the Great Lakes region, so Lake Huron and Lake Superior, and eventually they made their way to the northern part of Lake Superior. What happened when they arrived there is that they met other indigenous people that weren't really integrated into the trade networks of the, the, the of New France. So they started interacting with the Cree, the Assiniboan. One of the things that they discovered is the superior quality of the fur that they could get. So I mentioned this in another video, the Cree would dwell sort of in inland during the winter and during the summer they would go on the coast, whether it's of Lake Superior or the James Bay today, and they would fish during the summer. Pierre Esprit de Radisson, he described the Cree as the best hunters that he had ever encountered. And the Cree showed him the beaver pellets that they had collected. The beaver pellets were of superior quality in part because of the climate, it's way colder in that part of the, of, uh, of the country. So he started thinking, you know what, there's some commercial opportunities here. 
what can happen if we're able to get our fur from here instead of in this region, the Saint Laurent, where we're constantly facing Iroquois uh, raids and the product we're gonna be getting is even better. Plus, we're gonna be able to provide our products that the Cri, the Assiniboine, the Sioux, the Ojibwe's don't even have yet, whether it's gunpowder, metal tools, rope, whatever, you know, they didn't have any of that. They weren't as integrated in the trade networks of the Saint Laurent or even uh, the Dutch at the time or the English. Something else that he thought about was what could possibly happen if we were able to have ships that could go into the Hudson's Bay. We could just build some forts here, have the indigenous people come up to the coast, trade furs with us. And by that time, you know, a couple of people had explored Hudson's Bay, like Henry Hudson. People had heard about it. They knew that it existed, but no one had really been able to establish like a permanent settlement there because of the, the climate was just so harsh. Pierre Gaspil Radisson, he thought, what can happen if we're able to establish ourselves in that area? Him and Grosselier made their way back to New France. The New France administration were actually not happy with them because to them, it wasn't good to have more furs on the market because we have to understand at that time, New France had sort of a monopoly on the fur trade because that's before the Hudson's Bay and all that stuff. France, New France were the only people that were were able to provide fur to the European market. Think about it, if you're the New France administration, because New France was so poor, so isolated, basically blockaded by the Iroquois, what they wanted to do was artificially maintain the price of fur at a high cost because that's how they would finance their operations and the survival of the only colony that France had in, at the time in, uh, in North America. Supply and demand, you know, the lower supply that you have of something, the higher uh, price that you can charge. So he came back to New France, they were not happy, they taxed the crap out of the furs that he brought back. He basically lost all his profits. So, you know, he's thinking, they're not gonna let me do my thing and make some money. Who can I go to that could finance this operation that I am thinking about? Radisson thought of, you know what? The English would be willing to finance my operations. He didn't really care about all this religious, political conflict. He he wanted to make some money. Dada Radisson, along with his uh, his partner, Grosselli, they went to England and they started talking to some people, some high-class businessmen, political elites too. And they were talking to them about the potential that the Hudson's Bay had. You should finance my operations because you're gonna be able to bypass all of this conflict. Forget the French, they don't want to expand necessarily and in fact they don't even let me you provide me some ships i'm gonna go into the hudson's bay park myself in james bay i'm gonna establish the relationships with the Cree, the assiniboine because i know the customs i know the languages i'm gonna be able to establish a really really strong trade network i'm gonna get the furs that are gonna be of better quality and then we're gonna ship them back into england and you're gonna be able to sell them at a lower price because i'm gonna have more furs and they're of better quality in the end it was a win-win that's ultimately how the hudson's Hudson's Bay Company got started. The Hudson's Bay Company was started by Pierre Gaspé de Radisson who wanted to bypass all of this French bureaucracy. He went to the English because he knew that they would finance his operations, this idea that he had about the fur trade. But here's what you need to remember. Hudson's Bay, a renowned English company, was started by a French guy, Pierre Esprit de Radisson. So this was in 1668 when uh, Pierre Gaspé Radisson officially went into the Hudson's Bay. And up until 1673, the Hudson's Bay Company uh, got their furs from, uh, from the First Nations people and uh, shipped them back all the way to England. In 1673, this changed in a way because uh, Louis XIV came to power in, uh, in France. And Louis XIV, for the people who don't know, he's the guy who said, I am the state. And he took the colonies that the French were trying to establish in the Americas a lot more seriously. And he he was providing more funding, more people, more weapons. The French administration persuaded Pierre Gaspé de Radisson to come back, bring back his allegiance to, to France by basically offering offering him a whole bunch of money. Pierre Gaspé de Radisson, he thought personally that he was sort of getting ripped off during his uh, Hudson's Bay operations. You know, he would get paid a fixed uh, salary but had no stock option. Pierre Gaspé de Radisson became the leader of La Compagnie du Nord, the Company of the North, they call it. You would translate that in English, which was basically a ripoff of the, the Hudson's Bay Company. So La Compagnie du Nord did have success starting in 1679. That's only because Pierre Esprit de Radisson was part of the this operation. And again, it goes back to the fact that Pierre Esprit de Radisson had the knowledge of not only the land, but also the people. He knew the customs, 
He knew the culture, he knew the languages, he knew the environment too, which was a very important factor. You know, most people that would go in the James Bay area, Northern Ontario, Northern Manitoba, they didn't know what they were doing. They totally underestimated the impact that the climate would have. They didn't know how to hunt. They didn't know how to fish properly. And during his time as uh, being part of La Compagnie du Nord, he actually uh, burned down a couple of English forts and uh, killed some English uh, new settlers that were working. For that, he actually got in trouble, ironically enough. So that was in 1683. So he was coming back to New France, you know, coming with a shipload of furs as usual. And again, the French administration confiscated the furs. They gave him crap. And the reason they were not happy about that is because France and England uh, were in peace. Killing English people at the time was considered illegal. <laughs> and Pierre Gaspard de Radisson, he, didn't, he either didn't care or didn't know about it, but either way, he was in trouble. They kicked him out of La Compagnie du Nord and he ended up unemployed again. Eventually what happened again is that the English convinced him to come back to work for the Hudson's Bay. He swore his allegiance forever to the English and blah, blah, blah. Pierre Gaspé de Radisson, he switched on and off again between the French and the English, depending on who would offer him the best, you know, opportunities for adventure, for freedom, for making some money, you know? So he joined the Hudson's Bay Company again, attempted to finish what he had started. Pierre Gaspé de Radisson died in England in 1710. He retired as being part of the Hudson's Bay Company, left sort of uh, an underrated legacy in our history. I find anyways because he's not a very renowned figure despite playing a large role really in the discovery of new territories and the implementation of the Hudson's Bay Company which in itself played a ro large role in, in Canadian history. You know, he was a free spirit in a way. He seeked out adventure. He seeked out freedom. He sort of built bridges in a weird way, we could say, during a time of, of violence, really, between indigenous people, French, and, uh, and the English. But again, he didn't really care about, you know, political allegiances, religious allegiances. He grew up with indigenous people learning their language. He grew up with the French. He did business with the English, but never fully trusted either of them. For me, that's why he's the Jack Sparrow of Canadian history because he seeked out adventure. He won freedom, didn't want to be tied down by central authority. He managed to sort of juggle his way between indigenous people, the French and the English that all sort of had conflicts between, between, between each other. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video on Pierre Esprit de Radisson, an underrated Canadian uh, historical figure. It's one of the many videos on history and Canadian figures, Canadian historical figures that'll be coming, uh, coming your way. I'm just seeking to explore Canadian identity too, and to know our identity as a nation, we need to know our, our history. So I'm gonna be making videos that will be covering uh, the history of Canada and, and other things, you know? So stay tuned. If you like this video, uh, subscribe to the channel. I also have music. You can find it on most music platforms. So Spotify, Apple, and all that stuff. You can find it there. Yeah, thank you very much guys, and I'll see you at the next video. Bye.